Mike, Kevin was your group partner when you did YC in the summer 2015 batch. What idea did you apply with? So our basic idea at the time was was really to use uh, to use credit card data to help investors make better investment decisions. Um, and I think like one thing that and that is actually not really far from what we do today. Um, the only like the main evolution is that now we work with companies as well, not just investors. Mm. Um, but I think a big a big part of the idea, though, is not just to look at credit card data and try to find interesting things and then tell investors about it, but instead to build an analytics platform throw that in front of investors, and then let them answer their own questions. And what led you to coming up with that idea? Oh, that is a good question. Um, so uh, I did not, like, I, I don't come from an investing background, or I, I don't come from finance at all. Um, I, I actually worked in video games. Um, and the same is true of my co-founder, Lillian. So she uh, she and I met at Electronic Arts. Um, uh, we worked together there and then at a um, uh, another gaming startup. Before that, I was in ad tech and like I've always been in, you know, we're both software engineers. Like we've always been in the tech world, uh, but we've got plenty of friends in finance. And one of those friends just out of the blue called me one day and was like, Mike, I need your help. I've got two terabytes of data on a hard drive. How do I load this into Excel? And that, <laughs> that, that was like, it was, it was one of those moments where, uh, again, I'm, uh, as a software engineer, right? Like, yeah. you know, I, I hear, I get this question, I'm like, oh, God, you know, like, why? Like why? Like why are you asking me this? Right. right. So he's in New York. Like I'm. I'm in the Bay Area. It's the middle of the, middle of the afternoon. Um, uh, why? Like why am I fielding this? Um, and I. I like wasn't feeling particularly helpful. I was like, <laughs> like what? <laughs> you know, what did? You, uh, what did your engineer? Like what? You know? Did you ask your dev team? Did you ask yeah. your engineering team? Um, and I just hear silence. And then, Mike, what are you talking about? We've got an IT guy, and that's it. And that blew my mind because he was at a $30 billion hedge fund. And like, I just assumed that all hedge funds, you know, looked like Two Sigma or Rentec or, you know, these, yeah. these like just these, these places that have hundreds of quants and hundreds of engineers. But in reality, um, most, uh, most hedge funds have a handful of analysts. Um, and just some back office support, right? They don't have any coders in house. Um, that I think that's when we realized there was this huge opportunity because investors are like, in, you know, in, in investors, they, they make money off of, uh, off of having an information edge, right? Off of knowing things that other people don't. Um, and they're like, and, a lot of people who work at hedge funds are very, very clever, right? They're, they're looking for this edge, like wherever they can find it. And, um, over the uh, like over recent years, increasingly they've been looking at things like Google Trends, right? To see like, oh, is there some leading indicator in search terms um, that would uh, indicate some you know some like bigger shift in consumer sentiment about I don't know some company? Um, Very unsophisticated sort of analysis. Yeah, yeah, but at the same time, like a clever idea, and it you know oftentimes works, right? You've got investors like subscribing to things like Comscore, looking at how many how many uh, uh, how many visits to a web website are happening and because that roughly is like roughly correlated mm -hmm. um with uh, uh with actual sales um and it's also like this nice leading indicator uh, in the sense that um public companies only come out with they only report metrics uh, once a quarter and it's like not right at the end of the quarter it's actually sometime afterwards so you can actually look at how many people visit, if you can see how many people visited amazon.com um, over the past quarter, then like you can look at the full quarter in, of information um, and then you can see how well that correlates with, you know, the resulting uh, reported performance. So how'd you go from like helping someone with like a two terabyte Excel problem and working on video games to being like, okay, this is now time for us to like quit our jobs yeah. and then solve this problem. Because like, <laughs> What were you doing there at EA? Like, what yeah. were both your roles? Yeah, so um, so we're so we are not video game programmers, right? We were working at a video game video game company, but my specialty was building high scale infrastructure, um, and Lillian's specialty is is building data pipelines and 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 analytics teams. Um, and what you know, when you look at when you look at the video game space, you know, like what, like how does, um, how does like a company like, uh, like Zynga, I think Zynga, Zynga epitomizes this, right? They're, um, they're like very metrics driven, very data driven, right? They, um, they were, one of the things they did very well is like optimize that they optimize the hell out of their games. So when you think about an online game and you think about, um, what you want to optimize for, right? You want to actually, let's just, let's, 
let's talk about this in terms of fun. If your game is too hard, no one's going to play it. And the game is too easy, no one's going to play it. So you have to find like this balance where the game is not too hard and not too easy. Um, and if you have an online game, then you have this like amazing leg up over, um, over games that are, you know, like pressed to disc and then shipped out because you can update them. Mm-hmm. Um, if you, and like the, the best way to tell if your game is too hard or too easy is to simply look at, you know, where, like how far people make it into the game. And so, um, For instance, you could look at uh, how many players make it, you know, from level one to level two. Um, And if there's like a severe drop off, right, if like not enough people are doing it, then it's a signal that, hey, you know, maybe, um, you know, maybe we need to tweak this. Uh, Of course, the person who needs to answer that question um, is a game designer. And usually game designers um, aren't writing SQL. (laughs) And so, you know, you've got all these metrics, like you're tracking all these, um, uh, all these events, right. Of, of like, oh, a player, you know, uh, they passed level one, um, or like player died or whatever. Uh, all of these events are being tracked and you, you know, you're like, this is, this is like a standard sort of analytics pipeline, right? You've, you, uh, uh, you, you instrument your application, you have all these events, uh, streaming out, you store them somewhere, you do some sort of processing on them, and then you dump them into some place where, um, you can, uh, some place that you can query. Uh, but then you've got these, um, these people who typically aren't coders, like a game designer or a product manager, they want to answer questions about how people are behaving in the game. Um, and, you know, you, you basically have two paths at this point, right? If a game designer says like, how many people made it to level two? Then as, uh, like as, you know, somebody on the data team, you can say, okay, you know, let me run that report for you. And then you go and you like query it and you put together the results and you send it back. And then, you know, they look and they say, oh, this is great. How many people made it to level three? And you're like, oh, you roll your eyes yeah. and you're like, I see where this is going. Um, and at that point, you're like, okay, I have, a, I have a choice. I can either play this like go between, right? And like fetching data over and over again, um, or I can build tools, right? And if I build a tool and hand that tool to the designer and say, you know, here, like answer this yourself, then, you know, I can focus on doing like much cooler things mm-hmm. um, and much more interesting things. Also, I'm out of the, I'm like, I'm out of the way now. Like I'm mm-hmm. no longer in the way of um, this, this person answering their own questions. Um, this is, this is exactly what we did in the, in, you know, in the video game space. And, um, this is a pattern that we recognize could be really useful, uh, in the investment space, right? You've got all these, um, all these, uh, investment analysts and they, like, they know so much about the companies, um, that they are uh, making investment decisions on. Um, and they know what questions they want to answer. And so you can either put yourself in a position where you're trying to guess at the questions and like writing pre-writing reports and trying to sell them reports, or you can just give them uh, like give them some sort of tool that actually empowers them to, to answer like all the crazy questions that they thought they couldn't answer. So this is the thing that's like fascinating. You guys are building tools for understanding how to improve video games. How does that become all of a sudden the skill set needed to sell financial and analytics software and insights to people who run like hedge funds and investment firms or even to do corporate like competitive tracking? Because to me, it's just like, I imagine they're going to ask about like, what's your background? How do I know? Like, how how does that start? Like, what made you realize that like, we could probably do this? Yeah, um, I think it comes down to like, like, what is the fundamental problem being solved? And, you know, like the fundamental problem is that you've got somebody who probably isn't a coder and they want to answer a question um, uh, of behavioral data. You write video games and then how you decide what was the first product going to be? Yeah, I mean, I think for us, it was uh, it was really digging in further to understand what types of data uh, investors were most interested in. And what we found is that uh, is that transactional data, like specifically credit card transaction data, is one of the things that they were really excited about, but they were banging their heads against it, right? Like this is uh, fundamentally um, uh, transaction, like credit card transaction data is it's a it's a messy and un like there it's a messy data set with unstructured data problems baked into it, and the skill sets of investors, even the more technical ones, um, those tend to lean more towards like. Uh, 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 like time series analysis as opposed to dealing with large, messy uh, data gotcha. sets. What kind of questions like were the in- investors interested in like from that data set? Yeah, I mean, I think like one of the one of the main things is just 
like how how is Chipotle doing, right? Like are they um, so like uh, they famously had a food poisoning uh, uh, incident a couple of years ago. Actually, I think they had several, but. Um, you know, they wanted like investors, <laughs> eager investors wanted to know, um, you know, what is the impact to their to their uh, to their actual revenue? How and, come there was no way to answer this before you guys came onto the scene? Yeah. So this is one of the interesting things. So there actually was a way to answer it. It was just a terrible path. Mm-hmm. Right. The way to answer this before was with a survey. Right. So you go to some market research company and you say like, hey, um, there's this, you know, like Chipotle, the food, the whole food poisoning thing. Um, you know, can you can you help me understand like how many people stopped going to Chipotle? And they just have to like try to find a bunch of people that match a demographic and then hope like these people will answer. Are you going to represent like? Exactly. America. It takes it takes weeks or months. It costs tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. You end up with this tiny sample of, you know, like, oh, good. We got 100 respondents. And they said mm-hmm. that, you know, they, um, uh, you know, from this this pool of 100, you know, like 20 of them said that they uh, have considered stopping uh, stopping uh, their their Chipotle like dining altogether. And then what do you guys do instead? So for us, you know, we like because we have direct observations of millions of US consumers, like we see all the purchases, mm-hmm. right? We can just look it up right away. In fact, like we don't even need to look it up. We can just give you a tool and then you can uh, find the answer yourself. And so you got your first customers during YC, correct? Yes. How did you go about even getting them? Yeah, that's a <laughs> that's a good question. I have to think back. So this is 2015. So our very first customer uh, was a VC who also ended up investing in us. Um, and I think one, one of the things that was interesting is that, um, actually this is one of the, this is one of the things where we got to, I feel like we got to cheat a little bit because, because we were in YC, Mm -hmm. like because we were in YC, like all the, like VCs are always excited to, to talk to YC companies and that's. I mean, they're trying to figure out who is in the batch and then try to invest before demo day. That's exactly right. And so we had uh, we had a whole bunch of these um, these like funny uh, these like funny meetings where, you know, we're trying to get in front of them to, you know, pitch them on a product. And, you know, they're happy to take the meeting because they want to hear about what we do. And so it ends up being this like dual purpose thing where they're like, okay, show me the product. Now tell me your business model. And you're like, well, would you like to buy the product? And, (laughs) you know, fortunately, like a lot of times the answer was like did end up being yes. Um, and now most uh, most of the VCs here in the Bay Area, they are our customers, you know, but it was really interesting navigating those, those, those early conversations. What were they excited about? Because like with credit card data, there's some things that it's really good at showing and identifying and some things that are not so good. So for example, it tends to be great for predicting consumer trends, but yeah, I mean, I, it's basically, uh, I think you just have to keep in mind, like, like what is it we're actually seeing and what we're seeing is spending for uh, a large proportion of us consumers. And so like if the, if it's, if you want to understand a company that doesn't, uh, that doesn't target consumers, if it doesn't target specifically us consumers and more specifically, if it doesn't sell things directly to them, right. If it, mm-hmm. if it, you know, if they, like we're not going to see General Mills, mm. right? That's all sold through grocery stores. Um, but if it's something that you might see on your credit card statement, then like those are the things that we can help with. Like Uber, Lyft. Exactly. All the meal, like Gobble, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and then what you're not going to see is like B2B enterprise companies, et cetera. But it tends to be like lots of people are interested in consumer stuff because they're like the fastest growing, most interesting segment. Exactly. There's like, there's there's more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's the, the, the market is more than big enough. And so are they using it as a market sizing tool? Not for, as a, because if you're investing in a seed stage company. Yeah. yeah. So um, probably the primary use case among among VCs is actually diligence, right? And when you think about like like put yourself in the shoes of of a venture capitalist. So um, you know, some company walks in and they say, you know, they they throw some numbers on uh, uh, on some slides, they show it to you, and you're like, okay, great. Like, is this? Uh, I have like lots of follow on questions. Do I, you know, do I? try to get these, um, the numbers from you. Um, and then additionally, there's a whole bunch of questions I have about, uh, about your market, which you may not even know the answers to. So a good example of this would be, um, if you are like, so as a VC, somebody comes in and pitches you, um, they're in, uh, actually let's just talk about bird and lime, right? So 
So imagine you're a VC, Bird comes in and pitches you and mm -hmm. they're like, they show you, they show you this chart and it's like, it's the perfect hockey stick chart. And you're like, this is amazing. You know, like I've never seen growth like this before. Um, and uh, at the same time though, you've, you know, you've heard of other companies, you know, Lime is out there. You've heard of like maybe jump bikes. You want to pick the best one. Exactly. Yeah. Like, are you talking to number one? Are you talking to number two? You know, like what's, um, and then also uh, fundamentally are the, like, if you know, if uh, Bird is showing good unit economics, like is that um, uh, is that best in class? Mm -hmm. You know, or could it be even better? Uh, and this is an area, like this is one of the key areas where we help VCs um, is in giving them visibility, not just into the company they're talking to, but into um, into their competitors, right? Into uh, each of those, like every company in that space in relation to one another. So we can say like, oh yeah, bird lime, like here's where birds winning. Here's where limes winning, right? Here are, um, here are, uh, where the differences are in how, how like how well those customers perform, like how much they spend and yeah. so on and so forth. But how, when you say unit economics, how do you uncover that data? So we don't see unit economics. So, okay. Sorry. So, um, so obviously like we don't see the cost side. We just yeah. see the, the, the spending side. Right. So you could say, you know, an average bird customer spends $40 a week versus a Lime customer that might be 20. Exactly. Like, and I think okay. in, in generally, like if, again, if you're, if, if, if you're a VC, like you, you have, uh, you have your own, uh, ideas for how to estimate, uh, the cost side of the equation. Okay, gotcha. What other metrics are you able to show? Like, I was always impressed when looking to the dashboard inside of Second Measure about like, wow, I can not just see like how much revenue is like being pulled, um, but also things like cohorts, lifetime value, etc. And so, like, like what? <laughs> what metrics like get investors like super excited? Yeah, you guys I mean, show them. I mean, let's. Uh, I guess taking a step back, let's think about like what are the main problems that we're trying to solve. So, um, so one is is generally the um, it, one is generally focused on company performance, right? And this includes things like competitive intelligence and benchmarking, right? Like, show me, um, uh, you know, what what is. I don't know, like what, what is the relative market share of the various meal kit players? Um, you know, how, uh, how long do their customers stick around? Right. How, um, how much do they spend over time? Right. Like what's the, what are the lifetime sales after 12 months? Uh, and again, if we split those into different cohorts, you know, are those, um, are newer cohorts performing, uh, better or worse than older cohorts? So there's all of these things in and around, um, company performance. And then separately, there's stuff around um, uh, consumer behavior, right? And this, these are things like, where else do my customers shop? Um, the things intended to help you get a better picture of, you know, who your customers are um, and like really help you hone in on like who your best customer. And I'm saying you, but really it could be you. It could be your competitor. It could be a company you're doing diligence on, mm -hmm. um, you know, some target company. What, what are some good examples of that? Because your blog is basically just this, right? It's like just insights. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's interesting, right? Because our core product is really about uh, it's really about empowerment and saying like, hey, you know, you as a user, you can answer whatever questions you want, like within this within the space of, of U.S. consumer spending. Um, but then and, and we don't sell uh we don't sell research mm -hmm. um but oh so you don't answer questions for people directly so we'll do it on a case by on like a project by project basis but we we're not the ones coming up with the questions right if somebody comes gotcha. to us and says like i have this specific question um you know i tried i tried this in your application like it you know i can't quite answer it yet like i have this more specific question um can uh you know could it be answered um those are cases where we can, you know, we can do it like a one-off research project. Uh, but those are, and those are like paid projects, but we don't publish those. So the thing we don't do is we don't proactively do research and go out and like, you know, call up 10 of our clients and try to sell it to them. Gotcha. What's some stuff that you guys have put on the blog recently that's your favorite? Yeah. Um, so... So we've started some, one thing we've started doing is, uh, so, uh, actually, uh, if we talk about our blog, uh, we, we also need to talk about, um, like our press mentions. So we actually work with the press a whole ton, hmm. right? And so we keep getting quoted in like Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, et cetera. And I mean, this has been great for us. It's great for the reporters too, because, you know, they're trying to write about like the upcoming, like potential lift IPO or, you know, whatever. Uh, and, they want to support their reporting with more information and we can help provide them, uh, them with that information. We're happy to do so. Um, 
the Uber Lyft thing is like a recurring topic. And so in our blog, we've decided, you know what, we're just going to keep publishing periodically, um, are, are the, publishing updates on so that. So when you choose like a, a question you want to ask about like the Uber versus Lyft, do you guys like have come up with the initial questions and now you like listen to what the press are kind of asking you that mm. they want to verify or is it always you guys are coming up with? Um, so I'd say it is us always coming up with it. Um, we actually have a dedicated ed- editorial team. Gotcha. Um, so we've got, you know, we, we literally have a, a, a team of, of data scientists and writers um, who just pay attention to what's going on in uh, like in the news, mm-hmm. you know, what's going on, um, you know, with with companies that like could potentially be uh, interesting to others. The person who runs it, like, you know, she has a journalistic background. I mean, this is this is their core focus, right? Is find interesting things to write about it, uh, write about and then write about them. So let's talk about some examples. So uh, before we started recording, one you mentioned was Stitch Fix and Mm -hmm. where the customers of Stitch Fix do and do not maybe spend. Yeah. So So specifically we had, um, so this is a really interesting thing, right? Because uh, one thing, so so part of uh, understanding what questions people are asking is like just going out and talking to people. And um, one recurring question we heard about Stitch Fix was like, is Stitch Fix cannibalizing uh, like department store sales, right? Like, are they are they competitive with department stores? And so we decided to dig in. We had no idea what the answer was. Um, but we decided to dig in and um, we attacked the problem uh, by basically saying, OK, let's look at Let's look at people spending at department stores before and after they become a Stitch Fix customer. And what we found is that Stitch Fix had uh, no impact on department store spend, right? People just started spending more on clothes, period, Hmm. right? And in fact, the people who um, uh, Stitch Fix, uh, Stitch Fix's best customers actually spent uh, even more on, even more on clothes um, uh, before becoming a Stitch Fix Hmm. customer than after. Oh, like Stitch Fix inspired them to go out and find more clothes. Or yeah, to buy I think more. one way to characterize it is that uh, is that it you know piques their interest in in fashion, and so they uh, they don't they don't spend any any less. They just. But part of it is like it probably jump starts like a variety. They're like, oh, I'm introduced to a variety of stuff that I never would have considered beforehand, and now it's like, oh, now when I'm out there, at in the real world looking at stuff i'm like Mm -hmm. oh i'm more i there's more things that might appeal to me because i've been exposed to them yeah the key thing is that it's not displacing the spend right and that was i mean that was a real surprise um and also like it's also like a really important question to answer because uh if you're at a department store and you're trying to figure out like you know is this (laughs) stitch fix friend or foe yeah right right. like this 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 really points more to friend Hmm. so do you actively track like the rise and fall of brands because i'm wondering there must be instances of certain things being swapped out on a recent post was uh peloton memberships going up ahead of soul cycle right so that's really interesting is that is that are there trades happening that you can follow um so sorry when you say trades do you mean people so uh you know sign up for peloton instead of soul cycle yeah so uh i mean really we again we this is something we will uh attack from an editorial perspective um but again it's you know like our core business is about um putting a product in front of uh in front of our clients that they through which they can answer their own questions Mm -hmm. um now on the blog side yeah i mean the peloton's Peloton and SoulCycle story is super interesting. Like Peloton is a beast. Mm-hmm. Um, and SoulCycle is, uh, has some interesting, like actually, so, so after we came out with this article, SoulCycle, basically they had a, a, a nice like non-denial denial, um, where they basically said, uh, like, <laughs> We don't know what they're talking about. Their numbers are like our numbers are great, um, but didn't actually dispute the mm. metrics. To give some context, what did your blog post say? And then what was oh. it that like SoulCycle was nervous about? I mean, the short version is that um, Peloton has now surpassed uh, SoulCycle in terms of like the number of active Peloton members, right? And this is based on a spending, uh, based on spending behavior. Mm-hmm. Active Peloton members uh, on a monthly basis. Um, have surpassed the number of soul cycle like active riders on a monthly basis mm-hmm. is there an overlap like a venn diagram of like people who were used to be soul cycle and have switched to peloton um there is there's both like a current overlap and there's like a you know the the sankey diagram type thing of like you know people who used to be one and now are another whoa hmm. have you been following how amazon basics has developed their products uh 
I am generally familiar with it. I'd say for us, that is uh, not something what we have a lot of visibility into because um, at the end Amazon. of the day, we just see an just Amazon like a general purchase. Amazon. Exactly. But you've done some research about Amazon Prime people. Yes. Yeah, we did. Um, so this is this is a case where we did a much deeper dive, and we actually gave uh, we gave several talks on this. So. Um, One thing, and this is, you know, this is spearheaded again by our editorial team. Um, You know, one of our data scientists, Brandon. So he, so he dug into uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon's customer base, and specifically, you know, want he wanted to like understand really the differences in behavior between Amazon Prime members and non Prime members, and like how that's changed over time, and really like how important. Um, Amazon Prime's members are to Amazon. And uh, one of the, I think one of the interesting takeaways is that increasingly Amazon is looking more and more like a subscription business. Like they're increasingly reliant on um, Amazon Prime customers uh, for for their revenue. Hmm. And then another interesting thing is that even people who, so people who became uh, an Amazon Prime subscriber, even if they uh, lapse, right? Even mm-hmm. if they uh, are no longer a subscriber, um, they're still spending more on Amazon after than they did before. Uh, how do you get to that conclusion that like, like, what was the evidence that showed that like, oh, Amazon is more focused on subscriber? Like, how did you guys sort of like, get I, to that conclusion? I would characterize it that they're less, it's not that they're more focused on subscribers, but instead that an increasing proportion of their revenues derive from people who are Amazon subscribers. I got you. So it's one of these things where it's like, oh, it's turning out like Amazon's most valuable revenue streams comes from the Amazon Prime subscribers. Yes. And, it, and we don't know the reason why, but like there's obvious things that people can sell like portend. For example, it's just like, hey, they already pay for this membership, so they might as well use it yeah. when they're ordering and buying stuff. So it's like an excuse to have something delivered to your house versus go to the store because I'm already paying for the membership. It's like a cost sunk thing. Mm-hmm. And so w- when it comes to um, product development on your side, are you incorporating this data in any way or is it just talking to your users, developing product from there? Yeah, so when we think about... Uh, when we think about improving our product, like we have a few different streams for um, like really feeding the backlog. So one is internally driven, right? And this is, it's based on, you know, it's based on like where we know we want to take our, um, our application. Um, And also uh, factors in, you know, us going out and proactively speaking with our own customers, like doing that user research and really like digging into their use cases, then use cases and then figuring out where the gaps are and then attacking those. That's one. Another is, uh, I mentioned earlier that we do some custom research uh, for customers. This is like, you know, think of it as a professional services, like, uh, 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 approach. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this is something that, uh, also helps feed our backlog because if, if we see recurring requests, then, you know, this is probably something we should add to our product. Uh, and then finally we have like the editorial side, which, you know, for us is like the best form of dog fooding, right? So we're, um, you know, we can go in and like try to use our app to answer a question. If we find that we hit a wall, right? Mm -hmm. We can't, it's like, well, we've, we've dug as far as we can go. And now we have to go to the data behind it to answer the question. Like, you know, that's a, a, a great signal that this is something we should probably build. One thing that's interesting to me is that I I feel like we just like recently just talked to Jay Klamka uh, at Insight Data Science, and I I feel like data scientists like hearing about your company like this seems like a dream job. Like I work on interesting problems and questions, and then you know even if it's with your editorial board that's figuring that stuff out, it seems fascinating to me. It's like oh every problem is going to be kind of different. We put that out there, and whether it's solving it stuff for your customers or stuff to like promote the company. Um, like, how do you look at like finding like because you guys are hiring right now, right? Yes. Like, how do you find a good data science? Or, like, what are traits that you're looking for that you know is going to be a good fit for this kind of like nebulous work? Yeah, <laughs> it's such a good question. I feel like um, data scientist is such a, a, a an overloaded and I think a bit overused, like an overstretched term. Um, I think for us. 
specifically what we're looking for um, are, you know, people who are like scientists with a capital S um, who have very strong quantitative backgrounds and can understand from first principles, like the problems that they're trying to solve. I think very frequently what you find are, um, you know, people uh, interested in, 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 interested in data science, um, you know, they learn a lot of the tools, but maybe skip over the fundamentals. When you say like are able to think from first principles, I think this is something I hear as a common theme also for people who are looking for good engineers mm -hmm. or product managers, et cetera. Like, what does that mean exactly? Yeah. Um, so let's think about it this way. So, uh, so we have, uh, so a third of our company have PhDs. Right. We have um, we're basically equally. So most of the team is technical. Um, How big is the team? So we're 60 people today. Mm. Um, and most uh, so most of the team is technical. Uh, and it's about an, you know, 50 50 split between engineers and data scientists. Now, on the data side, um, what you'll find is that we have people, you know, with backgrounds ranging from statistical uh, genetics to cognitive neuroscience to string theory to like to like uh, uh, earth science to climate, you know, climate science, like really all over the place. Um, and like the common theme though, is that all of them are extremely good in statistics, right? So that you've, you've got this, um, there's sort of this statistical foundation that in, you know, that in our opinion, like everything is built on top of. And uh, it's our view that if you come in with that, that strong, uh, that strong, like, you know, mathy foundation that, learning the tools like the tools can be taught right we can like we're happy to help uh, uh to help people get onboarded with like using python like okay cool you've only used r like that's fine right we can we can help you like learn to switch over to jupyter notebooks um but the thing that we're not going to teach you uh is we're not going to teach you how to do math mm -hmm. and then how does that translate like into the first principles so, because um, I usually think of it as like someone who's willing to challenge, like I will give someone a task and sometimes they will come back and say like, actually, can we just dive down? I was like, what's the reason behind this task? Mm -hmm. And maybe just be able to be like, oh, actually, I think I can improve the question we need to be looking into instead. Yeah, I think this, uh, a lot of this ties in with like the nature of the types of problems we're trying to solve, mm -hmm. um, right? You can't like, there's no, there's no like, I don't know, playbook of best practices for, um, for dealing with the problems associated with transactional data, right? There's no playbook on building a, um, uh, you know, an analytics platform focused on consumer spending behavior, right? A lot of the things that we're doing, um, you know, they're either like, we're either, we're doing them for the first time. And in some cases, maybe they are simply being done for the first time. Um, so it's something where we benefit from people who, uh, you know, who can approach these like big nebulous and open-ended problems, um, and come in and figure out how to structure and decompose the problem, um, and then tackle it piece by piece. So do you train for that or you just hope that they have it? Like, what, what is the test is my question, really? Yeah. Because, I mean, because it's really just like, here's a problem. But then before you get overwhelmed by the problem, because often you're told like, hey, you have to take route A or B, usually there's options like C through infinity, right? right. And so you have to ask why. And so how do you, whether it's through interviews or training, get that out of employees? Yeah, for us, um, I mean, I think of this as less a less something that we train people to do and more something that, you know, we, uh, we, we hire for, like we screen for in the hiring process. So uh, we, we've taken great care in designing and actually iterating on our interview process. Uh, and I'd say that there is a significant um, a technical evaluation where we're trying to test for exactly these types of things. Uh, for a data scientist, um, one of the things that we do is we actually, you know, give them a big messy data set and we say, do some, like, we, we, it's open ended, do some research, tell us what you were, and then present it to us. Like, tell us what you were looking for and tell us what you found. What's some common mistakes that, like, people do that end up? not working out so oh. well and what's some stuff that the really great employee and applicants have been able to do um I'd i know say, i'm trying to help people like cheat yeah. on you. <laughs> <laughs> i'd say uh the like the number one mistake that people make is that they uh you know they assume they assume too much of the data they assume the data is perfect right they assume that what we give them you know that like oh like this is easy all i have to do is just um uh like, you know, load it into whatever, like into pandas or load it into like throw it on a database and um, just start running queries, get the answers and then throw it into a slide and be done with it. Um, 
like it never like that never really works um because like this is and this is just isn't how uh data in our world works Mm -hmm. like there are always dragons like somewhere and so a big part of this uh of this exercise is like well, how, you know, like how diligent were you in looking for dragons, right? And anticipating um, these, these like problems. Um, and then, you know, you don't necessarily need to solve all of them, but you need to be aware of them because they actually uh, can distort your findings. And so as long as you like if you identify them and even if you have findings that are invalid, but you're able to identify that, you know, hey, like I found this thing. But I made this like I deliberately made this assumption, the simplifying assumption so I could complete it in a reasonable amount of time. Like, that's fine. So the good people, what they're good at is like not starting from their own assumption, but actually trying to query and figure out what were the assumptions that I'm working with. Like, yeah, exactly. Whether like, it's in the data, the question, et cetera. And so yeah. w- once you have that, it helps you understand it's like how strong or how weak is my ultimate conclusion going to be as a result? Yeah, I mean, it, it's like it's sort of like building a house, right? If you if you were to hire um, a, a construction crew um, to come out and build a house and they just came and they, they just like came out on site and they just started um, like erecting walls and then, you know, th- they hand over the keys, you slam the front door, the whole thing falls over because it was on a shaky foundation right, then like, clearly they failed. Um, And so for us, you know, what we like is to find people who really like to understand the foundation that they're working with, um, to make sure that it will be sound when they build the house. So I've never done a project involving credit card data. Can you but but then I use these like tools like Mint, Mm -hmm. and it consistently classifies things as the wrong thing, Mm. right? Can you explain to me why this stuff is not normalized? Because it seems like incredibly valuable potentially not that difficult obviously it is difficult but like why isn't it normalized why do you have to clean it all yeah um so i think i guess yeah maybe the easy uh, easiest place to start is like think about your uh think about your last credit card statement right like um think about a time where you've looked at your credit card statement and you saw a transaction on there and it says something like s bucks or um or, or like i don't know like mw space san carlos which would be like men's warehouse san carlos it doesn't say men's warehouse it doesn't say starbucks right it says something which if you like squint at it and you scratch your head a little bit like you as a human can probably figure out what it is um now the the problem uh is that like that uh the problem is that there are many different companies all you know putting in you know some piece Actually, the fundamental problem here is that um, some human decided how to represent that that store Mm -hmm. um, in a credit card statement. And they're working within this constraint of a a limited a limited space. Right. They only have a certain number of characters um, and they have to type something in, which, again, communicates to a human that like, yeah, you were at Walmart. (laughs) Yeah. um, So you don't dispute the charge. Um, but it was never designed, uh, for a machine to read. And so, um, like the result of this is that, um, there are, uh, you end up with this, this, this cardinality problem, right? You end up with, uh, many different variants, um, for a single, uh, for a single merchant. And part of our job is to find all the variants and to map it back to that singular merchant. But there, so you're saying there are multiple text strings associated with men's warehouse in San Jose or San Correct. Or whatever. Yeah. So within our data set, uh, we have, so we're looking at um, like 50 plus billion transactions. We have 1 billion unique transaction descriptions. And I'll tell you what, there are not 1 billion uh, merchants in the US. Right. Okay. So it, Mace, like Macy's alone has like 3 million different representations. What? What? Yeah, so, I'm just like kind of baffled that it was yeah. never like, hey, Macy's, your store number 1200, whatever, the, yep. done. So there are two, there are basically two layers of problems. So one is that, uh, you know, one is that, one is the the human layer, right? Where you've got somewhere you've got a human and they're setting up um, the point of sale, you know, system, like the, the swiping device for, um, you know, for a certain Macy store. Let's actually, let's just talk about McDonald's for a second. So McDonald's, you've got franchises. Mm-hmm. So when somebody sets up their franchise, you know, they they work with like a point of sale uh, provider and they get their point of sale set up. And like, okay, well, you know, what should this be? It should be like McDonald's... Um, I don't know, like F139. Okay, great. Right now we've got this, this one location. Um, the problem is depending on, depending on, um, 
how the transaction is processed, the apostrophe that you expected to, to <laughs> appear in McDonald's could be a space, it could be a star, it could be deleted, right? It could just be, you know, McDonald nothing s, um, right? And like basically uh, the, the two problems, you know, one is a, a human one where different humans could describe things differently. They can even typo the name of their own company. Um, which happens. Um, and then the second problem is uh, there are like various per perturbations that can take place um, uh, in the processing uh, uh, chain. Hmm. I think part of it was like the corrections had to happen by users of Mint. Yeah. And I think humans don't want to correct that data. No. Diligently. And also if it turns out it's like, oh, I can see a human getting really frustrated where it's like, this is the 50th time I had to correct that this is coming from McDonald's. And therefore, like, I no longer want to correct this anymore because, like, this is just not any good. And so the problem actually is, like, oh, all of them are so different. And yeah. so humans are giving up on the classification when really it's like, this is actually more I have, like, such different. limited incentive to classify my own data. <laughs> yeah. like, I don't really care. I mean, I'm sure some people do, but I don't really care well, how much I, I mean, spend the, on food. The problem gets even worse, Sometimes right? I don't want to know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I need to sit in that, like, fast food denial. Yeah. If Amazon was all classified in one category, that would not be good. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, like, this, you know, if you're uh, if you're coming into this, like, with a, I don't know, like, a, a, a software mindset, right? You're thinking, like, oh, yeah, there should be some, like, unique identifier for, uh, for Blue Apron, right? But... But if you actually just look at all the Blue Apron transactions, what you're going to find out is that, you know, there's actually more than one Blue Apron. Did you know that there's a Blue Apron grocery store? Um, that's, oh, that's very close. It's in Brooklyn. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, things like that. Or like United. Uh, like United, um, United Airlines, of course. Uh, but then there's also a United grocery store. Um, and they show up, in some cases, they show up the exact same on your credit card statement. How much time are you guys spending cleaning up data? Is it like perpetual and nonstop? Um, so uh, so we don't think of it as like a fundamentally human. There are human elements of it, but I mean, really it's something that we, you know, try to use machine-based approaches to get, to like operate as a giant lever. Um, for, uh, I guess we think of it this way, right? We, we've basically had to build two different products. So one is this pipeline, which ingests raw transactional data and then output something useful. And like, you know, the, the things that we do in that process are things like, like this, uh, this entity resolution, um, which is what we've just been talking about with merchants. But it also includes like other things like, um, you know, figuring out um, for an Uber transaction, it says San Francisco. It always says San Francisco. But, you know, obviously not all Uber rides are, <laughs> are like right. in this city. So um, oh, looking at other transactions around it to see like, oh, maybe this originated somewhere else or exactly. Like so we figure out uh, we figure out the location of the the of the purchaser um, based on, you know, where their other purchases are. Um, and that lets us uh, like fill in the gaps. So we say like, oh, you know what? ignore this location for uber um, and instead you know use this computed location um, there's there are other things that we need to solve and then there's this whole other thing around um, uh, uh, around debiasing right because we basically have this 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 longitudinal study going on right we have this panel um, the panel of consumers and obviously it's not going to be a perfectly representative sample of the us so uh, you know so we endeavor to figure out all the ways in which it isn't representative and then apply corrections to make sure that you know whatever results you get do represent the greater population so anyway so that's that's one thing that we're building is this this pipeline and we've got uh, 10 to 15 people working on that um, but then we also have our analytics platform right this is the um, think of it as the the hyper specialized tableau where mm -hmm. you know we've we've built in lots of different analyses um, that operate on this this nice clean data set that the pipeline is outputted one increasingly growing set of customers for you guys are like corporations doing this for like sort of i guess competitive analysis yeah how did that come up and so like why is that i mean i can see why it would be interesting to them but i'm just wondering are they looking at questions very differently when they're looking at your platform to answer them yeah i think this is like this is a really interesting journey for us because you know we started out um, building a platform that was focused on helping investors um, understand company performance 
right? And YC hammers, you know, hammers in that you need to f- like focus, focus, right? Um, that it's not like it's better to have uh, something a small number of people love than uh, something that many people just like. And we took that like, you know, we really took that to heart and we didn't want to work with companies for a long time because we were afraid that it would uh, spread out our focus. One of the things that uh, changed our thinking um, was this uh so there's a, a book from clayton christensen so he's a professor at um at hbs and he wrote innovator's dilemma more recently he published uh, a book called competing against luck and in it he talks about um he talks about the the theory of jobs to be done and like the basic premise is that um when you're thinking about you know substitutes for your product um you shouldn't be thinking about things that just look similar to your product instead you should be thinking about you know fundamentally what is the job that your customer is hiring your product to do mm. right and if uh and this this i guess cha- this changed the way we thought about focus um because you know like this whole time we've been we've been thinking like oh investors 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 but in truth there are many different use cases for investors right a fundamental discretionary hedge fund right like a think of it as a, a a group of analysts who are um you know working in excel and trying to figure out like is you know is um stitch fix a good like a, 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 a poised for growth in the longer term um like they have a very different use case from uh a a, a quant investor who's focused on like someone who has a purely systematic strategy and is trying to qu- trade um you know on a daily weekly or even like like just quarter to quarter based on where they think uh, companies are likely to beat or miss relative to expectation, right? These are different use cases. Now, if we if we think about one of our core use cases as being uh, uh, helping people understand company performance, then that's when we began to understand, like, okay, well, investors want to know how companies are performing, but so do other companies, right? Companies want to know how their co- uh, how their uh, uh, competitors are doing, and um, we had a really convenient way into this because we were working with so many VCs. They were actually bringing our product into the boardroom. You know, they were showing like they were showing their portfolio companies and then the CEO would raise their hand and say like, wait, how do I get that? Mm. It's an interesting sales strategy. Yeah, I think like maybe you could speak to that a little bit more because there are so many YC companies and and oftentimes people just think like YC is just consumer. Very much not true. YC is just software, also not true. Um, wh- how do you guys think about your sales process? Yeah, I mean, this is um, this is an area of focus for us now. Um, we we were very very fortunate to have um, just a ton of, I mean, really like a ton of virality, which is like a funny thing to talk about in the context of really enterprise sales. Um, but we actually haven't done any outbound sales yet, right? We have 150 clients. Every single one of them came to us through inbound, right? They uh, basically, you know, somebody signed up and then they they told their friend about us. Mm-hmm. Um, their friend reached out, loved what they saw, signed up, told their friends and so on. I mean, it's a box of secrets. Yeah. And so to me, it's just like, hey, I have this thing and it lets me see stuff that it's like that I've never been able to see before. And so like that's a very remarkable thing that's easy to spread around. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, everyone knows that, you know, Uber is bigger than Lyft, but like how much we can actually quantify it. Um, and I think that's it's a lot of uh, like it's yeah, it's a lot of fun. And for cer- certain people, right, it's sort of uh, it unlocks like a new way of doing their job. Um, and so it's 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 become like table stakes. Uh, and that's that's been great for us. Um, but now, like, you know, we just raised our Series A. Um, so that was led by Bessemer and co-led by uh, by Goldman, by Goldman Sachs. Um, and then we also had participation from Citi. Um, like that, Citibank. Correct. Goldman Sachs and Citi, that's such interesting partners or investors to be leading around. What, what, why were they super excited? Especially, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, so we, uh, we, fall into so I, i'd say that the 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 reasons are different for each mm-hmm. so we fall into this general category when you're when you're talking about the investment world we fall into this category um, of companies generally known as like alternative data uh, companies so hmm. uh, alternative data basically refers to you know anything that can uh, any information that can help you understand how companies are performing um, that isn't just 
the traditional reported fundamentals um, or like stock prices or things like that. So this uh, collectively, it's referring to credit card data, um, satellite imagery, uh, web traffic data, geolocation, uh, like from uh, data from mobile devices and so on. Gotcha. Um, Goldman Sachs is making has made a big push into the alternative data space. Um, and, you know, they they had not made an investment in any company touching uh, uh, dealing with credit card data. Um, and so we're like, you know, we're their horse in that race, if you will. Awesome. Um, and they've been just phenomenal. I think, I think like here, uh, here in the Bay Area, there's like so much of, um, it, like, you know, everybody's focused on working with, um, you know, with like, tr- like big traditional VCs. Um, but I think, you know, we've actually had uh, tremendous success, uh, working with sort of like, I don't know, less, less uh expected players i guess out here so um our seed round was actually led by jeffrey's another investment bank and one thing that we found uh to be true for both jeffrey's and uh and goldman is that they they are uh extraordinarily well connected you know like in new york city in the east coast with not just investors um, but also with companies right because they're investment banks um so they've been uh they've been just tremendous in terms of um, helping us get in front of more, uh, you know, more of the types of, you know, clients we, we want. Um, now for city, of course, they have a ton of, uh, of, of transactional data. And like, this is something that, you know, they like, this is a pain point that they feel internally, like all the things that I described about, um, about messy transactional data. Um, they it, understand. It seems odd to me that they wouldn't have a handle on this already themselves. So it's a really, really hard problem. Like I can't understate like that why are enough. Like why are they so bad? Why is everyone else it's, so bad? <laughs> it's not, I wouldn't say that it's, ever, that everyone else is so bad. I think it's just that. Um, You're so good. Ev- <laughs> or their other products are so profitable. <laughs> yeah. It's that, uh, I think it's the people are focused on solving specific problems. Yeah. And so like, I wouldn't say that, you know, like Mint is, I wouldn't say that Mint is terrible at, um, at identifying, uh, at like, understanding transactions right they're just they're they're good at different things because they're focused on solving a different problem right like mint.com is not trying to like they're sorry they're trying to solve the problem of you know what we need a best guess as to what this transaction is but we need to do it for all the transactions right like we flip that problem upside down we say you know what we don't care about most transactions we only care about the you know 5,000 or so companies that we track and growing, right? We care about that and we can't be wrong because if we're wrong, somebody's going to lose millions of dollars. Ah, uh, so the constraints actually help make it much easier as a result of not having to focus on everything. Exactly. It makes the problem tractable. And because we're focused on that, like what we're, fo- mm-hmm. like what we're discovering is that um, there are, uh, there are, surprisingly interesting applications of this thing that we built for this like hyper specific use case. Um, you know, we're suddenly we're finding out that like, oh, this could, you know, this could help, um, you know, this type of company, uh, I don't know, find, uh, find new customers, right? Like it's a company that sells to other businesses and they want to find fast growing businesses so they can sell to them. Um, this is, uh, I think this is one of the, this has been one of the interesting parts about our journey is discovering like really by accident, you know, all of these um, uh, additional use cases that we really didn't anticipate. One thing that's tricky, and it's probably one of these like great problems to have as a company, is that like if you're like people's secret weapon and it becomes table stakes to be like, hey, if we want to stay ahead of the game and I have to, like Bloomberg is a good example. It's like, oh, I have to sign up for Bloomberg if I'm a trader to use this. And I think second measure might easily become into that category as well for a lot of investors. I feel like the tricky part is then like if all of a sudden now everyone is using us, like, how do you develop the product? Like, how do you keep it interesting? Yeah. So, um, and keep this, people on board yeah. versus like jumping ship or trying to find some other solution. Yeah. I mean, this is, uh, this is a really, really good point in particular for, um, uh, for the investment audience, right? Because, uh, investors are looking like they, they make money off of information edge. They make money off of knowing things, things that other people don't. Um, and this actually informed, uh, a lot about, how we tackled this problem because we could have very easily focused on um, 
on selling, uh, quote, insights or, quote, signal uh, yeah. to hedge funds, right? Where we we say like, oh, here are the most interesting, I don't know, like uh, trading signals. And we send those out. But as we uh, add more and more customers, then, you know, the value to each one um, becomes significantly diluted. And so, um, you know, we took the view that in particular, because uh, transactional data, there's no single owner of transactional data. There's no way to to like control how many people have access to it. Why not just assume everybody's going to have access to it one day Mm -hmm. and then focus on building um, uh, building a tool to help people, um, you know, answer more creative questions. Right. And our view is that even if everybody has access to the same data, um, that if they simply focus on asking better questions, they'll still find their own edge. Now that's for the investment community though, on the corporate side, uh, on the corporate side, I mean, really the fact I, that you're a fact that, um, you I, know, somebody else, I think that would be delightful. Doesn't. It's like every major corporate company is yeah. like, we have to use this for competitive analysis. I mean, like if the worst case scenario was you were Bloomberg, you'd, you'd be okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think Bloomberg's doing just fine. Yeah. Right. Um, all right. Awesome, Mike. Thanks for coming in. Oh, definitely. Thank you.